Okay, in this lecture we talked about genetics, which is the science that studies biological inheritance. Heredity, this is the passage of functional DNA segments called genes from generation to generation. And what a gene is, is it's a sequence of DNA that codes for a functional product. It's a code for a functional product, which is always going to be a protein. Now, for genes, there are different forms of those genes, and those are called alleles. So alleles are alternative forms of genes. For example, uh, we have genes for eye color, but of course there are different um, eye colors. And that's because there are different forms of the eye color genes, and those are called alleles. And then genomics, this is the study of the entire human genome, the full DNA sequence. So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, this is the molecule that encodes um, our, our genetic information. So as far as its structure, it's a double helix. It looks like a twisted ladder. And it's really the, um, the blueprint for all of the cellular functions that occur in, in each of our cells. Now the molecule has three main parts. It has a, a backbone of, of a sugar called deoxyribose as well as phosphate and nitrogenous bases. And there are four bases. Two of them we call purines, and those are guanine and adenine. And the other two are called pyrimidines, cytosine and thymine. And we always have a purine that base pairs with the pyrimidine to make kind of the rungs of the ladder. So in the double helix, guanine, G, is going to pair with cytosine, and adenine is going to pair with thymine. And this occurs by hydrogen bonds. So here is just a little... Um, little things showing DNA, so A's and T's, T's and A's, C's and G's, G's and C's, just like that, and that forms the the rungs of the of the twisted ladder. And then the backbone, called we call it the sugar phosphate backbone because it's uh, both sugar and phosphate. Now we know that DNA will eventually become protein. And the processes by which that occurs is called the central dogma of molecular biology. So the first step, DNA has to be transcribed to a cousin molecule known as RNA. And that's ribonucleic acid. Okay, so DNA is transcribed to RNA. That process is called transcription. And then RNA is going to be translated to protein uh, through the process of translation. Transcription occurs in the nucleus. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Now, um, the way, kind of the, the set of rules um, that determines how a particular sequence of DNA becomes protein, that's called the genetic code. And the genetic code shows that three consecutive either DNA or RNA bases, it really doesn't matter, which are called codons, they code for specific amino acids. And of course, when you put amino acids together, they become proteins. So this is the genetic code. And we have molecular machines that read uh, three bases at a time. So, for example, when we're talking about translation, which occurs in the ribosomes, the ribosomes will read, you know, say it's U, U, U. That, uh, that codes for the amino acid phenylalanine. And this just continues, continues, and c continues, and eventually you'll get a protein. Okay. So in each of our cells, we have lots and lots of DNA and we have to package that DNA and in a dividing cell we package them as chromosomes in a non-dividing cell we just call them chromatin so a chromosome is a, a condensed form of DNA which is wrapped around proteins called histone proteins these are positively charged proteins DNA is negatively charged so the DNA wraps around these proteins if you think of DNA like yarn and you think of the histones like a spool that's kind of um, how it's set up, how a chromosome is set up. Now, the DNA plus the histones is known as chromatin. This is pretty much what's present in a cell that's non-dividing. So if a cell is not dividing, you won't see any chromosomes. You only see chromosomes when cells get ready to divide. Now, we have two types of cells in the body. We have somatic cells and we have gametes. The somatic cells, these are basically all cells except the gametes, which are sperm and egg. And we call the somatic cells diploid, or 2N. And that means that they have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So somatic cells have a total of 46 chromosomes. Now this N, N equals 23. We call 23 the haploid number. 
So these are diploid, meaning they have two times the, the haploid number, two times 23, which is 46. Now, the gametes, these are, this is sperm and egg, they are haploid. They are one times n, or one times the haploid number, so they have a total of 23 chromosomes. So, of course, when sperm and egg meet, that's where you get your 46. Now, the first 22 pairs of the chromosomes are called autosomes, okay? And they are homologous, meaning they're pretty much the same. You get one from each parent. The 23rd pair, these are the sex chromosomes. And in the case of females, they are homologous because females have two X chromosomes. Or, in the case of males, they are non-homologous because they have an X and a Y chromosome. So here's just, uh, I really like this picture down here at the bottom. Here's the DNA double helix, and this associates with these, these are the histone proteins. And these histone proteins just kind of keep coiling and coiling and coiling and coiling until you have an entire chromosome. This is called a karyotype, which is basically a chromosome map. This is a special one because uh, these chromosomes have basically been paint painted with fluorescent dyes. But as you can see, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes in the somatic cells. Uh, the first 22, they're all homologous. The, uh, the 23rd pair, this is the sec these are the sex chromosomes. In the case of a male, they're non-homologous, because you have an X and a Y. And in the case of females, they're homologous, two X chromosomes. So genotype versus phenotype. Genotype is the genetic makeup of either a cell or an organism. The phenotype, these are the expressed properties or the visible characteristics, the things you can see, the things you can measure. And phenotype is due to the genotype as well as environmental factors. So down here you can see that you know this particular fly has a genotype of SS, has the SS alleles, which gives the straight wings, these are things you can see but it's due to these genes. And then this one has the genotype of WW for wrinkled wings and what you see, oops, what you see are wrinkled wings. So inheritance patterns. When we talk about genes, you know, for each gene you get one copy from mom, one copy for dad, from dad. And for many genes with uh, just two alleles, the effect of one of those alleles will mask the effect of the other. And this is called the dominant allele. If, if an allele masks the effect of another allele, it's called dominant. And the, the allele that's being masked is called the recessive allele. Okay, And we represent that as um, something like AA. Okay, So big A, that means it's dominant. Little a means it's recessive. Okay. And that's true for, for everything. So if you see a, a capital letter, that means that's the dominant allele. If you see a lower a lowercase letter, that means it's the recessive allele. Now, if somebody has both a dominant and a recessive allele for a particular gene, they're called heterozygous. If they have two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles, we call that homozygous because they have two of the same. So this is just an example. Again, you get... Um, you get one, one allele from mom, one allele from dad. So this is called a Punnett square. And in this case, this, uh, for whatever gene this is, um, the father is heterozygous, the mother's homozygous, and this is what the children will be. Now, most traits are influenced by multiple genes, and those are called polygenic. So the vast majority of traits are actually polygenic. They're due to multiple, multiple genes. Okay, so penetrance and expressivity. Penetrance is given as a percentage. And basically, it's the percentage of people that have a specific genotype that also show the phenotype. So, for example, um, uh, an, a heritable type of cancer known as heritable retinoblastoma has a penetrance of 90%. That means if you had 10 children that had the genotype for he uh, heritable retinoblastoma, only 9 of them would get the disease. But they all have the genotype, but only nine of them show the phenotype. That's penetrance. Expressivity, this refers to the severity of the phenotype. Okay, So I, I gave the example of neurofibromatosis. Basically what this means is all of the people might show the disease, 
but they might ha uh, have different severities of disease. So penetrance can be 100%, meaning everybody shows the disease, but the severity of the disease varies. Okay, so mutations. Mutations, these are permanent changes in the DNA sequence or the structure of DNA, and they can be inherited. And if they're inherited, they're going to be present in um, pretty much all cells in the body because they're going to be germline mutations. Acquired mutations are only present in certain cells. You know, for example, if somebody has melanoma, those cells um, have acquired mutations, but you can't pass melanoma on to somebody else. Now, these inherited mutations, they can be passed to future generations, but again, these acquired mutations cannot. Okay, so here's just some examples of some of these mutations. So up here we have a normal sequence of DNA. We talked about these substitutions. These are also known as point mutations. And I talked about, and this is when you change uh, one of the bases to a, to a different base. And uh, I talked about silent mutations, which are just an, uh, an example of these, these point mutations. Silent mutations, this is when there's no change in the amino acid sequence. We talked about uh, missense mutations. This is when um, there is a change in the amino acid sequence. And this might have no effect, or it could be uh, very, very detrimental. And then finally, I talked about the nonsense mutations. This is when you change to a stop codon. So remember, a codon is uh, one of these uh, kind of triplets. And a couple of these codons are called stop codons, and the stop codons basically tell the ribosomes that the protein's long enough and they, uh, they need to stop making protein. So what happens with these nonsense mutations is you get proteins that are, um, that, are too sh that are too short, basically. Now we also have insertions and deletions, and these um, cause what are known as frame shift mutations. And what this does is this changes how our molecular machines read the, the sequence. You know, I gave the example of, of a sentence. If you take words out of a sentence, it changes how you read it. If you insert words into a sentence, it changes how you read it. So it changes the reading frame of the, of the DNA. Okay, then we started to talk about the ways in which genetic diseases are transmitted. And we talked about autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and also the, the sex-linked transmissions, mostly sex-linked recessive. So autosomal dominant inheritance. This is when a person, a person is affected if they inherit just one copy, one copy of the bad allele, okay? Uh, males and females are going to be affected equally. Typically, one of the parents um, will be affected these don't these don't skip generations usually you you see it um, pretty much in every generation now if one parent is heterozygous meaning they just have that one bad allele the children will have a 50 percent chance of being affected if both parents are heterozygous the children will have a 75 percent chance of being affected and the examples i gave were marfan syndrome and huntington's disease which we talked about in more detail so autosomal recessive Again, males and females are going to be equally affected. Um, generally, this, this tends to skip generations. It doesn't have to, but it tends to. Now, if both parents are unaffected, um, but heterozygous for the trait, we call those carriers, 25% of their offspring will be affected. Now, remember, with autosomal recessive inheritance, you have to inherit two bad copies. Okay, two bad copies in order to have the disease. Now, if both parents are affected, meaning they both have two, you know, little a's, they have two bad alleles, all of the offspring are going to be affected. If one parent is affected and the other is not a carrier, uh, all the offspring will be unaffected, but they will all be carriers. If one parent is affected and the other is a carrier, 50% will be affected and 50% will be carriers. And a couple of examples are cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, which we talk about in more detail later. 
And then we talked about sex-linked inheritance. So the autosomal inheritances, which we just talked about, those uh, occur on the autosomes. Sex-linked, these are going to occur on the sex chromosomes, mostly the X chromosome. That's the one I'm going to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about X-linked dominant disorders. I'm just going to talk about X-linked recessive just because they're more common. Uh, with X-linked recessive disorders, they're going to affect males more often. Okay, and that's just because males inherit the just one X chromosome. So if they have the bad allele, there's nothing, there's not another X chromosome to mask it, which, which females have. So these X-linked recessive disorders usually affect males, as I said. All daughters of an affected male will be carriers. So if a male has color blindness, he's going to pass his X chromosome on to his daughters, and she's going to carry that, that trait. So sons of an affected male are unaffected, and unaffected sons can't transmit the disorder. Okay, Which makes sense, because sons are going to receive a Y chromosome from, from the father, so they're not going to transmit that, uh, that trait. So a couple of examples of X-linked recessive diseases, hemophilia, color blindness, um, a number of the muscular dystrophies, including Duchenne's, those are um, examples of X-linked recessive diseases. All right, we talked about mitochondrial gene disorders briefly. So mitochondria, which are organelles that, you know, make the majority of, of our energy, they have their own DNA. And there are about 35 to 40 genes within this DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother. We call that matrilineal inheritance. And there are a few diseases that are associated with, with mutations in mitochondrial DNA. An example is Lee syndrome, also Milos, which I talked a little bit about in class. And a lot of these are going to show up in, in the brain, in the muscles, areas that use lots and lots of energy. Because those genes in the mitochondria are going to code for you know, enzymes for, for energy production and things like that. So a pedigree, a pedigree is just a way to kind of determine modes of inheritance by, by looking how a disease progresses through generations. So this actually so shows an X-linked disorder, um, most definitely X-linked recessive because of um, males are exclusively affected here. Okay, chromosome abnormalities, leading cause of um, intellectual disability as well as miscarriage. So chromosome abnormalities are really, really common. Okay, they occur in, um, in 1 in 12 conceptions. Most conceptions don't, don't go to term. Um, and about 1 in 150 live births will have a chromosome abnormality. Ploidy. Ploidy just describes the number of chromosome sets in a cell. If a cell is euploid, euploidy, this means that it has a multiple of the haploid number. So 23, 46, so on and so forth. Euploidy means good. You know, we, we want the gametes to have 23. We want the, uh, the somatic cells to have 46. Uh, triploidy and tetraploidy, this means you have three times and four times the haploid number, and this is not compatible with life. Uh, aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means that a cell does not have a multiple of 23. And uh, typically, this is a result of non-disjunction. So when cells divide... Uh, we divide, we replicate chromosomes, and then we, we divide them and put them equally into new cells. Sometimes they don't move equally. Sometimes you'll have three of one chromosome go into one cell and one in the other, instead of two and two. And a trisomy is a type of aneuploidy um, in which a cell has three copies of, of a particular chromosome. And this is typically fatal. However, there are some trisomies that are compatible with life. So 13, 18, 21, and X. Also, um, monosomy. Monosome, uh, monosomy is when a cell just has one copy of a particular chromosome, and this is always fatal with one example, which was, which was uh, Turner syndrome. So besides the like, small mutations and um, monosomies and trisomies, you can also have kind of really large-scale aberrations that occur on particular chromosomes. So you can have big, big deletions, you can have duplications, you can have inversions, you can have what's known as a translocation where pieces of chromosomes basically swap places. 
So there's there's a lot of other things that can happen also. So epigenetics, this is the study of, of changes in the DNA that do not involve changes in the sequence. Okay, And these epigenetic changes can turn on or turn off certain genes. And the, this is a, not only is it normal part of, of cellular function, it's also necessary. These epigenetic changes and epigenetic modifications have to occur. It's because of epigenetics that, you know, we start as a zygote and we start as a little um, little ball of cells, but all of those cells become all of these, these specialized body parts. And it's because of epigenetics. All of those cells have the same sequence of DNA. It's just how that DNA is organized um, that kind of dictates which genes will be turned on or turned off. Most of this is going to occur at the transcriptional level, and uh, sometimes epigenetics can actually result in disease. This is kind of a hot area of research right now. So the first mechanism is DNA methylation. And this is when you attach a methyl group, which is this guy, to a cytosine. And methylation typically acts to repress gene expression. And when I say repress gene expression, I mean turn off genes. And this is really important for things like X inactivation. I talked about how even though females have two X chromosomes, one of them is inactivated. And just you, you can already kind of predict how this could be problematic when it comes to disease. So methylation of a tumor suppressor gene. If you methylate or you turn off a tumor suppressor gene, you're turning off suppression of tumors. And that can result in, in you know, something like cancer formation. So not only can we modify the DNA, um, the cytosines, but we can also modify histones. And this um, occurs mostly through adding or taking away acetyl groups, and we call that acetylation. And histones, remember, they act to kind of compact DNA, so we can organize DNA. But if we acetylate those histones, you kind of open up that DNA, and that up upregulates or turns on gene expression. If you take those acetyl groups away, it compacts that DNA, and uh, can turn off or down-regulate gene expression. Okay, then I talked about imprinting. So, again, we, we inherit one copy of each gene from each parent. Okay, One from mom, one from dad. However, for some of these genes, they are imprinted, meaning one of the copies from one of the parents is silenced. And if one of them is silenced, only the other one is going to be expressed. So we say that imprinted genes are expressed in a parent of origin specific manner and imprinting occurs through these these epigenetic modifications typically but can also occur through like deletions so epigenetics and cancer you know I kind of talked about this if you if you methylate you know DNA repair genes or cell cycle control genes or tumor suppressor genes you know that can lead to to cellular transformation and eventually cancer. Smoking has been strongly linked to these epigenetic changes to DNA, especially like methylation. And like I said in class, it's, it's you know, these epigenetic changes can be passed down from generation to generation. So the choices we make now can affect generations in the future, not only with our own, you know, so it doesn't just affect us, but it affects future generations as well. And this is just showing those relationships. So sex determination begins around the sixth week of uh, development of the embryo. And it's pretty much dictated by the presence or the absence of the Y chromosome. So in the embryo, the developing embryo, the primordial gonads will develop into the testes if the Y chromosome is there. If the Y chromosome is not there, they will just uh, stay in the abdominal cavity and become ovaries. And again, the number of X chromosomes is pretty much irrelevant if the Y is present, because if the Y is there, they're still considered male, okay? Not only genotypically, but also phenotypically. And of course, females undergo X inactivation. So this is just a concept map showing kind of all these, um, how all of this, um, all of these concepts come together to, to um, kind of cause disease. Okay, then we started talking about some of the actual diseases. So the first one was trisomy 21. And this is three copies of the 21st chromosome. 
typically caused by non-disjunction. Most of these are actually going to result in uh, spontaneous abortion or stillbirth. 20% uh, are going to die before age 10, and those that live past age 10 can expect to live anywhere from 55 to, to 65 years. So as far as kind of the clinical manifestations, low set ears, uh, the, the short stature, um, intellectual disability of, of uh, varying degrees. Males are typically going to be sterile. Um, females are often going to be sterile. Sometimes they can be re reproductive. Um, protruding tongue, that's pretty common also. And um, there is a increased incidences of things like uh, infections, immunosuppression, uh, malformations of the heart, um, dementia, so this is really just a, a small list of, of things. So here you can see some of these um, clinical manifestations of Down syndrome. Okay, Turner syndrome. This is also known as X-monosomy. And this is really the only monosomy that is compatible with life. And uh, so it's a, it's a monosomy of the X chromosome. So the female only has one X chromosome. And again, typically due to non-disjunction, and a very small percentage of these make it to term. So patients typically will have normal intelligence, oftentimes will have behavioral problems or learning disabilities, um, but there will be a lack of, of development during puberty, lots and lots of internal malformations, they often have diabetes, um, heart disease, uh, problems with um, skeletal structure and muscles, but also neck webbing. This is kind of a, a hallmark of Turner syndrome, which you can see here. Okay, and again, here's some of these these manifestations here. Okay, we talked about Huntington's disease, also known as Huntington's chorea or just chorea, and this is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning you only have to receive one copy of the gene in order to have the disease. And of course, this is always always fatal, um, and it's characterized by decrease in cognitive function and also um, movement disorder. So again, autosomal dominant, it's actually a defect on chromosome 4, and what happens is you just have this uh, progressive degeneration of areas of the cerebral cortex, which is important, obviously, for cognitive function, but also the basal nuclei. And the basal nuclei are very important for, for movements. So this disease is particularly devastating because the age of onset is about 35 to 45. And this is, you know, right around or, you know, right after the, the childbearing years. So... Since this is autosomal, autosomal dominant disease, you know, there's a 50% chance that, that the children will be affected, assuming that the, the partner is unaffected. But it's characterized by these fragmented involuntary type of movements, that's known as chorea, and also the progressive decline in cognitive functions, behavior changes, mood changes, and life expectancy is anywhere from 10 to 10 to 20 years after the onset of, of symptoms. So this is just showing this um, defect on, on chromosome 4. It's actually pretty interesting. It's due to um, too many in, uh, repeats of these CAG codons, but you don't worry about any of that. Just know it's autosomal dominant. So diagnosis, family history is important, obviously. Um, you know, typical medical history, genetic testing will definitely confirm it if there's no family history. Again, this can show up spontaneously. Probably about 33% of these cases do, um, so that's something to keep in mind also. Physical exam and um, imaging, there's no cure, and it is eventually fatal, but, um, you know, it's kind of symptomatic care, trying to improve movement as much as possible, maybe some uh, speech and physical therapies, uh, all of that can be helpful, but unfortunately, it is fatal. So this is uh, showing... Um, somebody with Huntington's disease, their brain, you can see the significant atrophy, and this would be a normal brain. Okay, then we talked about sickle cell anemia. This is a disease of red blood cells, of course, and um, it's, it's an autosomal recessive disease, and it's caused by a missense mutation in a single gene. It's a single substitution of one base, 
causes a change in the amino acid sequence and basically normal hemoglobin A is replaced by um, hemoglobin S which is sickle cell hemoglobin. What happens is these red, red blood cells um, instead of being soft and kind of um, kind of spongy and they can move around and they can get through tight spaces they become very fragile they become um, kind of stiff they're obviously misshapen and what happens is they can they can occlude small blood vessels and um, and that can be obviously very very detrimental so clinical manifestations anemia of course for a couple of reasons one um, you know in some areas you're not going to be perfusing tissues very well uh, two, these red blood cells can't carry oxygen efficiently because hemoglobin, the hemoglobin is not normal. Um, so it's kind of like a um, kind of like a double whammy. Also, pain because of the occlusion of these blood vessels, jaundice during a uh, sickle crisis, and this is because of um, just the the uh, the breakdown of all these red blood cells, and and of course the breakdown product that's bilirubin and that pigment of course builds up. The increased susceptibility to infection, and this is due to damage of the spleen. Obviously, the the spleen is going to take care of these these red blood cells that have a sh they have a shorter lifespan. So the, the spleen is is working hard, and that can lead to to damage, sensitivity to cold, tissue hypoxia, and um, the list kind of goes on. Now again, this is autosomal recessive, meaning you need both copies in order to have the disease. However, people that are carriers, people that just have that 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 trait. Uh, they are actually resistant to, to a great degree to malaria, which is interesting. So here you can see normal cell, normal hemoglobin, and this in, um, in, in the sickle cell, this hemoglobin kind of polymerizes in a very abnormal way. Obviously it can't carry oxygen, and it also gives these, shells, uh, these cells an abnormal shape. And here you can see how this can occlude small vessels. So diagnosis... Um, family history, genetic testing, physical exam. So treatment, symptomatic, um, preventing infection, treating infection, reducing physical and emotional stress because that can cause um, changes in the diameter of the blood vessels, which can kind of exacerbate any um, occlusion that occurs, and also avoiding temperature extremes, especially cold, because cold causes vasoconstriction, and again, that's going to kind of complicate the issue. Um, so there are drugs to increase the levels of hemoglobin F, which is fetal hemoglobin. This hemoglobin binds oxygen very, very strongly, but it doesn't release it very well, so it's not a great replacement, but it is better than hemoglobin S. And also, you know, management of pain is important also. So again, just another picture showing normal red blood cells versus these sickled cells, and this is a peripheral blood smear showing these sickled cells. Okay, MELOS. So MELOS stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Uh, this is a mitochondrial gene disorder. Okay, so there's a mutation in a mitochondrial gene. It's a transition mutation. Um, you don't need to worry about that. And this is inherited, of course, only from the mother because we know that mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother. And just like most of these, these mutations in mitochondrial DNA, it's going to cause... Uh, problems in energy production, ATP production, and um, so you'll see problems with uh, with the brain, of course, encephalopathy, lactic acidosis because you um, you're making more ATP through through fermentation, and, and with that you you produce lactic acid and stroke-like episodes. And severity it, it varies a lot, and it just depends on the exact mutation and how much mutant mitochondrial DNA is present. So diagnosis, history, physical exam, ragged red fibers on muscle biopsy. That's that's pretty important for this. And um, as far as treatment, again, it's kind of symptomatic, trying to reduce uh, complications like seizures and if hearing's involved, which it often is, cochlear implants. Okay, then we finished talking about... Um, Developmental disorders started with neural tube defects. So these are developmental disorders caused by incomplete closure of what's known as the neural tube. And this is a structure during embryonic development that kind of it kind of closes. Well, it should close. It needs to close. And if it doesn't close, um, you can have um, a number of a number of consequences. So spina bifida. This is when you have incomplete closure of the vertebrae. 
and this is strongly linked to a deficiency of folate. There are three types, there's spina bifida occulta, meningocele, and myelomeningocele. Occulta and uh, meningocele, these, you know, if uh, occulta really, I'll talk about these on the next slide, but these are listed in order of increasing severity. And then anencephaly, this is when there's incomplete closure of the skull. Oftentimes there is decreased amount of brain matter and it's not compatible with life. This is just showing anencephaly. So spina bifida occulta. This is um, incomplete closure and there's no protrusion of meninges or any of the spinal tissue. So it's, it's a very minor defect. A lot of people don't even know they have it and it, you know, it's pretty much not going to cause any issues um, and doesn't really require any sort of intervention. Meningocele, this is when you have incomplete closure of the vertebral column, um, but you have herniation of the meninges, but no nervous tissue. Okay, so this will be surgically corrected and um, hopefully, assuming no consequences, these people will have relatively normal motor function. Now, myelomeningocele, this is the most severe, and this is when you have herniation of both the meninges and spinal tissue, okay, nervous tissue, spinal cord and the nerve roots, or the nerve roots. And uh, this will be treated surgically also, but a lot of these people will be, will be paralyzed from that, from that location down. So on the left, this is spina bifida occulta, just a very minor defect. Um, again, a lot of people don't know they have it. Sometimes you'll see a little, a little tuft of hair back here. This is a meningocele. Here, just the meninges have, have um, herniated out through this defect, and this little, this little bubble is filled with cerebral spinal fluid, but the, the, the nervous tissue is spared. In a myelomeningocele, you can see that you have herniation of the meninges as well as nervous tissue. And this is the one that's associated with paralysis from this point down. And this is just showing the same thing from a different view. So as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.